Hello, everybody. My name is Ulf Steinrup. Welcome to the Norwegian Foreign Policy Conference. We have a full hall today, and it's so really nice to see everybody showing up here. And also, welcome to all of you who are following us online. This is the annual conference that we have, and we always arrange this together with the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's a conference that, um, <clears throat> it's a kind of an opening conference for a new response project. So I'm sure that either the Prime Minister or the Foreign Minister will say something about it in just a moment. The goal of today's conference is two part. First is we want to cast light on the changes in the international society. And secondly, <clears throat> to try to discuss how Norway can and should uh, meet those challenges in the best possible way. Perhaps if we're good today, we might be able to introduce some innovation in Norwegian foreign policy. Everybody can participate, of course. You can um, menti.com. You can log in with a code that you can find in your program, so you can participate with that way. So we have a very uh, packed program, <clears throat> but with very competent people starting out. But let me say a few words that will frame, form a framework for the conference. We are uh, living in an age of drama. There are a lot of things that are happening rapidly in international politics with a great risk, a lot of um, uncertainty, swings, <clears throat> and this applies to many areas. Um, international finance, uh, commerce, international commerce, the transition of energy, how to get energy, and not least the technological development, which has been destructive in many ways. We see that uh, within international politics there are conflicts, lack of trust, war, tension, Ukraine, Taiwan, just to mention a few. And in, uh, in this country, international, there are social tensions rising. And we see there is a battle for the ideas of uh, democracy contra uh, tyranny. <clears throat> and uh, national and the global and protectionism and openness. So in many ways, I want to uh, quote uh, Stoltenberg. We're in a new situation, he said, then he told boss. And there is uh, the war in Ukraine is uh, going and it's in its 13th month. And there are humanitarian problems and uh, infrastructure that is destroyed. Not least, it's a brutal war. There is uh, military losses, uh, huge losses on both sides. Neither side has thought to change their strategy. And uh, Ukraine is determined to continue its battle, <clears throat> even if it hurts. They need more uh, weapons. They need uh, airplanes. They need help rapidly, and they need humanitarian help, according to the Ukrainians themselves. And a broad uh, consensus in the parliament. Så långt så långt har det europeiska och det transatlantiska samarbetet varit starkt. Alla land ökar sina försvarsbudget och studier visar också att europeerna faktiskt står mer samlade nu än de gjorde för ett år sedan i för exempel i synen på Ryssland. De flesta i Europa ser faktiskt Most people in um, Europe see Russian Russia as the enemy including Germany. But the conflict has many dimensions, and all of them have the potential for forming the uh, future uh, economic order. And it's uh, significant for Norway, too, and it affects our foreign policy and for, and for our investments and for our energy as well. Just to mention, um, Europe has phased out Russian gas, and that's given Norway a key role. The crisis also done that our partnership with Norway and the European Union has been increased in many ways. Uh, climate and uh, natural resources, perhaps one of the most important challenges that is intensified in the United States and Europe with this uh, adaptation to green. And the uh, United States has its Industrial uh, Inflation Act, and we have something similar in Europe, which also impacts us here in Norway. And there is a uh, discussion about the international order, 
Norway is a very small country, but Norway is very concerned with the order, the keeping order. And the uh, just think about a country that is <clears throat> a country that's a permanent member of the Security Council. The responsibility that happens there. Och inte minst så har har krigen visat att det stora globala bilden om den framtida internationella arkitekturen är er i spel. Men för mötes här så mötes Kinas president Xi med president Putin i Moskva. Folkens, i fjor så måtte vi kansellere konferansen, for Finlands president Ninestø fick covid dagen før. Nå er pandemien bak oss, men det føles som en evighet siden. Men spørsmålet om global helse og beredskap er ikke borte. Og vi kan fortsätta. Før helga var den samme Ninestø i Tyrkia, og da blev det klart at medlemskap i NATO vil snart skje. Og vi må tro Sverige vil følge etter. Dermed vil også Nordens politiske geografi... And so the no- uh, Norway's uh, political uh, politics has to change in this area. A lot is going on, and it's happening very rapidly. And to be able to understand these changes, and not to mention uh, to be able to adapt and to manage these changes. All of us, today we're going to have an exciting program. We're going to try to uh, cast light on some of these problems and first of all it's a great joy to be able to invite the prime minister Jonas Kurst uh, Garstöre uh, to the podium and to hear his thoughts thank you Jonas that you're here and that you're using uh, taking time out from your busy schedule to talk about it so the floor is yours uh, thank you Nupi um, was a counselor for us and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this very exciting series that we're opening today. So um, to be able to um, be given uh, 50, 50 minutes to give you all the answers is quite a challenge. <clears throat> but uh, we're going to hear from people who have an opportunity to contribute to this. But let me begin by saying, uh, tell you about the feeling that I have and meet old colleagues from the foreign ministry. He used to be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I remember to 2005 and 2006, where we uh, some people will remember that. The project was to challenge our instincts and reflexes in a time of change. We wanted to say å gjøre og vise at vi kan ha åpnere debatt om utenrikspolitikk og sikkerhetspolitiske veivalg. At uh, smånasjonen Norge hadde en tradition og kultur kanskje for å diskutere disse spørsmålene, de viktigste blant dem, i ganske lukkede rom, hvor vi fant brede enigheter. Det har tjent landet vårt godt. Men vår vurdering var på dette tidspunktet i 6-7 at vi kunne tåle større debatt om det, og det var stor interesse rundt om i landet. Jeg merket jo når jeg reiste som utenriksminister på universitet og høyskole, gjør det fortsatt. Noe av det mest spennende du gjør er å snakke om internasjonale forhold til unge mennesker med stor interesse. Vi vil diskutere norske interesser, norske verdier, og ha en åpen debatt. Så kunne man brukt de 15 minuttene på å snakke om alt som har forandret sig mellom da og nå. Og historikerne skal jo sette navn på vår tid. Jeg husker det inntrykket de gjorde på meg å le- lese Erik Hobsvam, den britiske historikeren som skrev boka The Age of Extremes. Og det var jo da, det var jo et århundre han beskrev, men det århundre var fra 1914 til 1989. Det var et knapt århundre. Boka kom i 1994. Og hva historikerne skal kalle tiden fra 1989 til, hva skal vi si, i dag eller når var det? at de inntraff en annen epoke. Veldig spennende og ikke lett å si. Men det er interessant å lese, og jeg gikk tilbake til 1989 og leste et foredrag som Johan Jørgen Holst holdt høsten 1990 på Nobel. But at the Nobel Institute, somebody said, Europe is in change, in dramatic change. This past year, we have witnessed an historic drama that is, uh, the course of events has really brought great change to us, most of us are becoming oriented as to what these changes mean for uh, insight uh, into what these changes mean for us. So <clears throat> the Cold War is becoming a thing of the past. Faith in Europe is beginning to uh, reignite. 
this is what the coming minister said at that time. <clears throat> now we are living in quite a different time. And as Ulf said, the war in Ukraine we have, we have the post-pandemic, we have uh, uh, President Xi in Moscow, tension in Southeast Asia, China's on the way up, democracy is under pressure, uh, human rights are being challenged, the United States is in change, and the United Nations let, uh, wrote a report yesterday, is writing on the backdrop of all of the change that is happening on all these fronts. So I would invite us <clears throat> that this series of response will res uh, challenge us to think how can Norway be challenged what alternatives are available to us? And I would like to present a picture that I used uh, when speaking to the foreign minister. This is a kind of a, uh, uh, you ask a question, can Norway make a difference? On the other hand, where are our own interests, natural interests? And if you look at this, you can see one corner where we have our own interests and where we can make a difference there. We want to have most of these areas. Uh, we want to have something to do with that. But in the other area, we have those areas where we do not have a national interest and where we can't really make a big difference. But if we use a lot of uh, efforts there, then we can ask, have we organized ourselves well? There are two things in the middle there. One of them is where we have clear interests, but not really been able to make a difference. And that's where our challenge lies. How can we create uh, tools and alternative ways of acting so that we can realize where we have interests? And then there's this last field that's always been exciting, where we don't have direct interests, but where we can make a difference. Nevertheless, are we interested in doing something about this? For example, to contribute to the peace uh, agreement in Colombia, that's not directly related to our interests, but we can make a difference there. And it can matter in a larger context, and we, can we have things to contribute there. So for me, it's very important to take this approach and make it a part of <clears throat> uh, our approach to the great changes and where uh, Russia's uh, attack and these things are uh, pointing to a parting of the ways in Europe. Norway is quite clear. We condemn the war in Ukraine. We give support to Ukraine with uh, weapons help uh, over five years. Uh, and the president of Ukraine said to me, that's very generous that Norway is giving us that help and that support. But the important thing is that it is for five years. It's not just a temporary thing, but it's five years of continual support. And I see from my allies and partners that Norway has shown the way forward uh, toward the political, uh, the political Ukraine. We're together with NATO. We have a hard grins border in Europe, and we are living with the consequences. It, the cost that it has for Norway is that compared with Ukraine, it has a very minimal impact on us. <clears throat> But what we are using to, to, for Ukraine is affecting our budget. Uh, we can, that would uh, be an amount to uh, satisfy all the uh, election promises for all the political parties. This tells us uh, developments last year went well. It can be difficult this year or next uh, in terms of budget. So there is a challenge how we're going to think about our defense. All of these things are necessary. But my uh, challenge to Norway when we discuss this, let us keep a cool head and let us try to uh, think soberly about our interests and values and understand it's crucial that we understand what is happening in Russia, what is really going on there. That doesn't mean that you agree with it or consent to it, but do you understand what is the driving force behind it? So I would quote one of the best books that I am reading, and I read again and again. It's short and it's small, but it's been translated into Norwegian, Timothy Snyder's book on tyranny. With 20 uh, points that we've learned from the previous century that mean something for the century we live in now. And we're going to go through all these uh, subjects today. It's a very exciting discussion. I want to quote one of, from Snyder, a quote from Snyder. He's a professor in Yale. 
he was an expert in the 1930s. <clears throat> People say history always repeats itself, and maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but these are important for us. To abandon facts is to abandon freedom. If nothing is true, then nothing can criticize power because there is no basis upon which to do so. So la oss være, uh, uh, ha et varmt hjerte og et so let us have a warm heart and a cool head when we assess what Norway's interests are around these things. We have to avoid being something that is easy uh, in Norwegian uh, is to be an uh, errand boy. Uh, all we are doing is comment about what happened last week. Uh, oh, a little bit of what's going on here in Donbass, and, and so we sit there and comment about it. We need to be more than that. What are the consequences for Norway as, with what's happening? We have to have a fundamental conversation uh, also about our relationship with Russia. It's a great subject, and it's going to continue because this is a dynamic situation. We cannot choose our... <clears throat> we can't decide things uh, that we're going to live in peace with Russia for a thousand years. It's the only uh, neighboring country that Norway has never been at war with, but we have a very sig significant uh, historic uh, geographical position. And when we look back on our projects in the past, things aren't as we had hoped they would be. We need to understand the changes that are going on and use the Norwegian and uh, your competence to understand how things are progressing. I am uh, concerned that some of the debate that it condemns uh, Russia's uh, warfare, that they're trying to uh, get rid of Russia. That's wrong. That's the wrong way to think about it. They are there, and they will continue to be a European a geopolitical uh, country that is our neighbor. So my colleagues, that, uh, that live in countries that are borders to there. They all have something to say about their contributing. Uh, <clears throat> there's one from, uh, I think she means uh, Estonia, who told about uh, she is the prime minister in a neighboring country. She says, I don't have the same story as the Norwegian prime minister, but we have to understand Russia and what it means to be a NATO ally and what uh, how we need to handle this new situation. It's dynamic. It's not going to remain the same always. How can we make a difference now? So there is a need for a fundamental debate about our relationship with Europe. And in the course of the last year, Norway has been a driving force. And the first visit from the EU's president to Norway came on Friday. And this was to do with the troll pla uh, oil platform in the North Sea. And von der Leyen said that these are important words uh, from a EU president that comes from Germany. Yes, uh, the needs of Europe, their gas needs were filled by Norway. So. Our contribution has really helped them. But it's more than this. The fact is, Norway is the most important supplier from a democratic country to Europe that buys gas from all kinds of sources. Uh, we deliver more than 30 percent. But with regard to Germany, we can see this uh, industry, this industrial cooperation that we have that has to do with hydrogen and the CCS. Germany has changed their attitude towards CCS in the last year. And this uh, country that is uh, for renewables that Norway is, uh, we can see how we've helped in this area. At the same time, uh, our attitude toward the Inflation Reduction Act, we have had a positive attitude about that. Norway has to look at that. How can we make a difference in, in light of this? Where are Norwegian issues lie? I'm quite sure that uh, this energy relationship is a key to understanding our relationship to Europe and our potential for being able to have a play a difference, make a difference. So there will be an interesting discussion about the balance between Europe and NATO. And I quite agree with NATO's general secretary. And I'm going to meet him formally in Brussels on Friday and say that the thought that EU should be an, a replacement for NATO, that is wrong. In some uh, European uh, capitals, uh, this is a thought that is going around. 
But most of uh, Great Britain and Canada and the United States, uh, these countries uh, have their uh, interests uh, apart from Europe. But for small countries like us, this is going to be interesting to discuss. The third area has to do with uh, uh, this, the Nordic area. Since the, 40, the 50s, sorry, um, collaboration between the Nordic countries and some circles, uh, people thought this was a real alternative. But we are now playing these cards once again. Sweden and Finland are, in, uh, are on their way into, the, they are in the United, uh, the European Union. So we have, uh, that covers uh, with one alliance, uh, a huge, uh, the European Union is um, comprehensive. But at the same time, there is another picture, looking at it from Russia's perspective, what they have around them, surrounding them from the Atlantic to the, in the extension of that, when we take over the uh, form, foreman, become foreman of the Arctic Road uh, Council, what is our vision there? What are our criteria for working in the Arctic Council in the years to come? What are we going to do with the, the Bahrain Secretariat uh, without Russia? Because Russia is not a member there. And my answer is that uh, while we are waiting for that answer, it's Sweden and Finland. Use uh, flowers. Uh, Swedish, Norsk, Finnish, Swedish uh, foreign policy and, uh, forces there. There are a lot of challenges in the energy sector, and there are big projects in Finland, also in Sweden, but in Norway. We know from our own debate how we're going to get a hold of that force, how we're going to uh, power, how we're going to exploit the opportunities we have to be a part of this switch to green energy. That's going to represent big challenges. But uh, against that backdrop, I want to go back to my main point. Russia's there, whether we like it or not. And we cannot, once and for all, uh, do something definitive uh, 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 in the long term. We can't have a static notion about that. It's important to say that the regime that there is there is responsible for the war. So what comes afterward, we have to maintain our thought uh, at the right time, how can we come back to a, a normal relationship in a balanced way? The last thing I would say from a Norwegian perspective, how can we do it? Our interest is that we have people who live in the northern countries. So in domestic policy, this is important. And let me conclude by saying, I had a note in my drawer. The uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, I still have this note. Uh, the goal of our foreign policy that is to make domestic policy possible. And that is a bigger and a more demanding agenda today. How can foreign policy make it possible for us to make choices so that welfare, work, development, uh, care of the elderly, and all of that can be dealt with? One of the aspects of foreign policy is that we use 50 billion crowns uh, for Ukraine. That's an example of how uh, foreign policy uh, is doing something that limits what we can do domestically. But as an extension of that, just to conclude, and I'm going back to the climate report from yesterday. We're going to reach our climate goals uh, that we have taken upon us that uh, obligation. But how we reach that goal is crucial as to how where are our interests are and how can we make a difference. So if we now can succeed strategically to uh, have this storage of CO2, that's something Norway decides to do, and if we can do this that is in a commercially acceptable manner and rewarding manner, that means so much more than just uh, what's happening in Agarn and Northern Light. And if this should be possible for India and Indonesia and Brazil, CCS is in Biden's climate plan, then this will mean a lot. If we can succeed <clears throat> with using gas, where, we, uh, where it's cleansed from uh, CO2 and we can store hydrogen, that can be a part, uh, an important part of our relationship with these other countries. So Norwegian goals cannot just be about Norwegian uh, goals. We have to think a little bit ahead. How can we contribute in an international context? 
So I could have talked about Africa and Latin America and the whole world, which is interesting, of course, and things are in change there too. But my appeal is, yeah, he said that in English. We have to do that. We have to ask ourselves questions in the time to come now. That uh, foreign policy is uh, something uh, that's solid, but it is a time to think about our instincts and our reflections and, and ask ourselves, where are they? And we need to think about that. So I'm welcoming up to response to NUPI 2023. Thank you for your attention. I hope you who are listening to English can hear now. I hope they've settled the problem. Time is getting away from us here. Actually, it said that I was supposed to talk a little talk a little bit and the others would come up, but just to keep to the agenda, just to um, ask the others to come up. Uh, thank you for your contribution, Prime Minister. But um, Christian Van Brusco, uh, the, uh, the next leader in the uh, Defense um, Institute. Number two, Hanna Skartvet, the political um, editor. in uh, a very important newspaper, VG. And a professor, President and Fritof Nonsis, um, Ivar Neumann. So let's have an applause for these people for this panel discussion. And so, so Jonas, these people, I would like to begin this by asking a question. You talked about our interests. But it's also a question of capacity. Uh, we can have decisions and we can have a line and we can have an agenda, but how to make adjustments uh, in what we invest in more in defense or less in uh, welfare. How do you regard these things, this type of problem? You said that we're going to also deal with uh, NATO on Friday. What is Norway's uh, um, allocation, Norway's uh, financial allocation to for defense, for example? The prime minister says it's obvious that this is going to be affected. So in general terms, we can say it has to be strengthened. Two commissions are coming. The total uh, contingency report is going to come. Two important reports are coming. We have made a couple of important um, things that we've done. Norway has given military support to Ukraine. That's part of our strengthened defense because <clears throat> what Ukraine is doing is also important for our own security. But looked at from a future perspective, we can say if you take domestic and foreign policy, everything that is produced over time is going down in price, except for two areas. And that is health and technology and defense. These are two areas where we need more. So we can see a little bit about how the pie needs to be divided up. And it's a matter of political choice. And if something is more important, we've got to do something about it. That means something else has to be less important. And so we have to understand, make people understand the importance of how we divide this pie. Keep our heads cool and not fall into some sort of form of psychosis uh, where we're, uh, we were frantic about the percentages are increasing because we need material uh, safety in terms of all the, mater the uh, material we need. And we keep our industry up and going. And But I'm also concerned. There's a tendency uh, after the Ukrainian war started that every week you read about the volume of material and can we keep giving it? We need a volume of material, but we need more than that. We need a thoroughgoing uh, conversation about the security arrangement that we all need to share. And I want to remind us of that important uh, doctrine about how in 1941 and 42, in Great Britain and in USA just began to discuss how to regard the war. Today, it's, it's clear to us, but in 41, 42, it was not clear. It did, we weren't sure how the end was going to be. We mustn't lose our ability to think how is the European uh, security structure is going to look in the future. Okay, the last thing for me, and then I'm going to turn it over to Hannah. I have a question, a uh, personal reflection, really. If you say what Olaf Scholl said a couple of days, 
after the invasion of Ukraine. And we had a very uh, good dialogue with Finland and Sweden and the NATO. Uh, there were very dramatic changes in Denmark. They have changed their reservation against uh, foreign policy involvement. So when you were talking today, you were talking on the one hand about this reflex. We've been there before in 2006. It's a kind of uh, uh, continuing uh, evaluation. You also referred to Holst and uh, this, uh, we're living in a time of radical change. <clears throat> but uh, when we uh, go into this project, are we just going to go in and make small adjustments or something major? Or is there something we just want to do something more of? You mentioned a couple or two or three things toward the end. Any of you want to answer that? I'm just thinking, like, to what extent of radicalness do we want to have here when we make changes? How radical do we want to be, in other words? Uh, the Prime Minister is saying. Or does the, the Nordic uh, cooperation, does that work? Uh, are we prepared? to uh, deal with the situation in view of what Biden is doing, you're never really equipped for what tomorrow brings. We have to have an acknowledgment of that. We need to have a dialogue about it. And the one that comes up for us uh, about uh, membership in the EU, I haven't felt like this is an answer that will give us the answer we need today. That's why I have not been pushing. That's very polarizing in Norway to talk about that membership in the European Union. We see that there's a lot of polarization, and that's not wise to contribute to that. But an extension of what I've been saying is that we have to work for a much closer and um, a strategic relationship to Europe and Central European countries. And I think we've been doing that these past few years. There have been so major changes, especially with regard to Germany and uh, EU as a whole, and the Nordic countries and the Baltic countries. We have been close to Finland and Sweden in their transition. <clears throat> and Finland, their neighbor, uh, their country to Russia, is, uh, Russia has been important for this. But we need to keep remembering there's a lot of mobility going on here politically. And it's always important uh, that geography doesn't change. That's uh, firm. So with respect to what Norway does to take care of our interests in terms of geographical, we just need to, uh, with this low tension in the north, at various times and in different contexts has served Norway's interests well. And we need to continue to do this and handle it wisely. But this means, among other things, that low, low tension in Norway, that Norway has capacity in the Nordic countries, that Norway can uh, fulfill important things in, in the North uh, without waiting around for others to be able to do it. And we are able to do that. Hanna? I'm sure you want to have some reflections about uh, foreign policy uh, considerations after what you've heard from the Prime Minister. When Stoda says that a, a new AU debate will be polarizing, we have lived very protective in Norway more than any other countries because of our, our economy. We are where we are, and if a, a war comes, uh, it's hard for us to take it seriously as other countries who when you travel to other capital cities, uh, they're more concerned about it. And Russia has invaded uh, this country, uh, Finland and Sweden. Uh, that They are uh, applying for NATO, membership in NATO. No one would have thought they would have done that several years ago. So my question, But uh, are the arguments for uh, belonging, being a member of the EU for in terms of our security bigger now than it was before? But to, to it's wrong to think, uh, to try to be a member of what we have, to be a member of uh, NATO, that has to do with security. I'm talking in more general terms, she says. But for me personally, I feel that our, I've always felt that uh, being a member of the United, uh, European Union is important for, my, for our strategic interests. But is that the answer? 
to uh, to use our energies toward trying to get that membership uh, with an unclear uh, result. I don't think that's the right use of our energy. So what we need to do now is strengthen our e economic and uh, political strategic interests together with other countries. There is broad agreement in Norway, so we can do that. So uh, that which is to do with politics, uh, energy, uh, equal rights, uh, what our uh, economic community uh, membership gives us. I think that is uh, where we are increasing our efforts. What do you think? I think what's important to think about with regard to the question of the European Union is the complementarianism between the EU and NATO, and politically speaking. These are two different uh, uh, things. EU is in a different position in handling different threats, uh, complex threats, whereas NATO, on their part, they're concerned with uh, being able to deal with traditional uh, military threats. With regard to Norway's approach, this ought to deal with how can we strengthen our cooperation with uh, the Un European Union and other threats uh, as to whether we are a member of the EU or not. I don't want to get involved with that, but this complementarianism is important to emphasize. What do you think, Hanna? Studer mentioned that we weren't supposed to comment so much, but let's look at the consequences. Uh, when you look at the support for the European Union uh, day after day, what can lead to change? That's what he was getting at. Our prime minister also said that, that it's difficult to uh, put a name to the time that we're living in. We know that it's a new time. Uh, we're not living in the Cold War. The Cold War was a global crash, clash rather, that for between Europe and the Soviet Union. And uh, now we have something between the United States and China. Uh, so the United States' interests are clashing with those of China. So there's less interest on their part for NATO. So one of the biggest parties in Norway are no longer very oriented about NATO. And several leading Republicans there are very skeptical to NATO. So Norway has to ask itself, is NATO a full-scale uh, guarantee against, uh, you know, for our security 10 or 15 years ahead of time? If not, then we have to ask ourselves, uh, the Prime Minister says the uh, Nordic collaboration might be an alternative. The more we in, uh, collaborate in the Nordic countries is better. We can't do it alone. If NATO grows weaker, we have only one other alternative, and that's the European Union. I completely agree with you, uh, Prime Minister. I, it's polarizing to bring this up, but I don't see any way out of it. But you mentioned China. Uh, things between the United States and China are becoming more and more tense. Will Norway sooner or later have to take uh, sides in this matter? If there should be a fundamental confrontation or war, and you read uh, American-European uh, literature, you might be surprised over here to read that this is discussed. But in 26, 27, 28, there might be a war over Taiwan. I think many people in Norway might think, is it really possible, or is it even important? And so people discuss that. I think that NATO has their strategic concept, and they have formulated it wisely. Uh, they agree that the regional challenge, uh, there is a warm, a hot cold going on, but with regard to our relationship with Russia, or no, sorry, uh, China, it's a more of a competitive situation. And so we're thinking we'll put China in the same pot, and we'll put Moscow in that. Uh, some people want to do that. Uh, China is authoritarian. It's a different type of government. Uh, they violate human rights. But at the same time, they're the, the China's the second uh, biggest uh, economy in the world. Climate, new technology, they are, we need involve, China's involvement in that. And I think this is the main approach 
that is now become uh, clear, even in the United States. But what happened with the previous administration was that Trump, he did something against China and Europe at the same time, where concerning human rights and trade are, in, uh, are related. So we don't, need, we don't want to come into a situation where we have to choose between the two things. But if we come to the point where we have to choose between the United States or China, we, it's over the Atlantic that we have our belonging. But we have to know how to handle these tensions that develop. So I think we need to do it together with others and not just think of it as a, a confrontational thing. Nevertheless, it's a fundamental conflict between democracy and our values and these authoritarian uh, values that uh, suppress democracy, right? Yes, but when I said this in my introduction, there are a number of democracies that are under pressure. But it, I, I see what you're saying, but the answer for democracy when they're under pressure uh, to, to go to war against those who are authoritarian, no, that's not the right way. We need to have our own house in order so that we can defend ourselves. And we need to be even more aware that we need to be able to defend ourselves against non-military threats, uh, cyber, uh, destabilization efforts, all of that sort of thing that's happening. We need to, um, that needs to be an eye-opener for the, the real problems that we're facing all over the world. And what Timothy Snyder has taken up with, too, this enormous civilian preparedness uh, needs to be awakened. It's not just military. Do we just need to choose? My answer is I think we will be put in a more difficult situation under greater pressure to make a choice uh, when you look at the confrontation between China and the United States. I don't think that confrontation will necessarily develop uh, you talked about a decoupling or a, divide, a division of the world into two. I don't think it'll wind up with that. But I think confrontation, both military and technological uh, and the economic, will uh, bring difficult choices to Norway and Europe. And in that context, I also think that our relationship to Europe is going to be more and more important as the time comes uh, with regard to how we position ourselves uh, in the uh, view of this confrontation. And also, in view of the uh, American increased presence in the Pacific, which will require more of Europe, Europe will need to take responsibility more and more for their own uh, security and take care of their own uh, security interests better than they do now. I don't think the United States is going to disappear from the European theater. I think the Americans will still be involved and interested in NATO. But I think that they will expect that we and Europe will take more responsibility in our own region. What do you think? I think the same. That means that the, more, the less interested uh, the United States is in Europe, the more Europe has to uh, offer. And as the prime minister says, it's not just a matter of the percentages that you allocate in your budget uh, to military, contra, something else. But you have to think about uh, self-regulation of, of our resources. If we are going to uh, stick with the American interests, we have to put more money in the pot. And ask ourselves, what are we willing to contribute uh, in terms of military basis and contribute more to that, for example? <clears throat> what about the United States? Are they going to obey Norwegian laws? Or are they going to have their own laws at these bases? That's part of it all. Uh, these are questions. So there are things involved here that are going to come up, and uh, the Americans are going to ask for us. Um, and so these are issues that need to be looked at. Norwegian fundamental interests. We need to under We need to let allies uh, come to Norway to train. We do it differently than we used to. Americans are going to invest significantly in some of these uh, positions they have in Norway. That's a good thing. Uh, 20 years ago, it would be different. But let's go back to this image that I've heard as long as I have been involved in Norwegian politics. There is a moment where the United States, oh, they, they're not, they've lost interest in Europe and they're going to go to Asia. I think it's true. Yes, they're going to go to Asia. But I think even under Trump, with his uh, rhetoric, American, they increased their involvement in Europe. Uh, 
So for a country like the United States, uh, with a relationship with 28 European countries that are related, uh, interoperability is the name of the game. And to say, ah, the Americans aren't going to use any time for that. Uh, that is not a very likely way to think about it. They are going to expect that Europe does more on their own behalf, yes. But when you think of the Norway's strategic position, I think that in the foreseeable future, this, it's going to have a real um, uh, importance for American, uh, America uh, in terms of uh, atomic energy, all the Arctic ice that's melting, the question of China. All of these things, interests are going to increase, and Norway has a role in all of these. If we play our cards right, then we will have an opportunity to keep this on an even keel. But some people think that China is a dimensional threat, that Russia is more of an immediate threat. Is that for Norway? What does that mean for this ranking for uh, Norwegian politics? It depends on how our closest allies define these things. And I've seen that from American politics and their emphasis on the Pacific, the conclusion that Americans have come to is that, uh, that uh, a country has never been able to uh, apply their economic uh, strength into military strength. But that's happening in China now. And so that's, uh, they consider it dimensioning. It's dimensioning uh, for the whole world that uh, China is the second largest economy in the world. But for Norwegian uh, alternatives, the way we look at it and the way America looks at it are two different things. But what's dimensioning for the America does impact how we see it, but it's not one-to-one, -one, that relationship. This matter of China. China is the Norway has a small economy compared with China, fewer resources, uh, kind of like uh, compared with the United States. So we're in a different situation. It'll be very, very hard for Norway to handle China alone. So the fundamental situation is we've written about it in Dupi a little bit how are we going to relate to the United States relationship with China and how they're handling things, I think it's going to involve a very close coordination with them. But the other thing to say is that there will be a type of competition. And the third is that there will be a form of conflict with regard to China. But when you look at it in the long run, Europe today is much closer United States in their China policies. And Europe is uh, going to move more in that direction. Uh, there's more European skepticism to China. And in, the, and in your own political platform, um, there's going to be more and more of a common Nordic-European China politics. In this political platform that the current government has used to uh, uh, build their agenda. So when you think about the in investment in screening, uh, all these different aspects of our foreign policy. But uh, we haven't reached a, a point where we need to conclude so much right now. But it's an interesting question about China and the uh, European axis uh, will come in there. But this freedom uh, agreement, has that finalized? There's not a lot happening around that now. But it's interesting to see 10, 15 years back, a lot of delegations with the prime minister went to China and signed contracts. And so, uh, and now Scholl has been there, and Macron was in there, and they're there a little while, and then they leave. And Macron says, we're going to have contact with China. But it's in a completely different level. And we, we see that there are two different dimensional relationships, such as China and Russia. Russia is more aggressive, China more in their technological impact uh, approach. Of course, this uh, is important for how we uh, design our policy, of course. This Nordic uh, European um, uh, policy, and that's how we ought to do it. But this is one of those areas where the Nordic dimension in the European context is important for Norway. Because we 
think alike more with it among the Nordic countries. What do you think about the United States' this is a ranking about what it means for Norwegian politics? I just want to point back to what the uh, uh, Prime Minister's comment is that, uh, how, that we can't eradicate Russia from the map. There are going to be a significant uh, uh, country for Norway in the future, too. They, they are there. They exist. And China the same. They've come to stay. And they are going to be a dimensional um, uh, factor for us, for Norway. So this confrontation that we see developing is going to increasingly form our environment in the next 10 to 20 years. So for me, it's quite clear that the, uh, this player is coming up to be just to, uh, to as important as Russia. But Russia is going to be important for Norwegian security interests. What do you think about it? Here we have an interesting uh, point. Russia is absolutely, uh, you know, desperate to think about their uh, role as a main country, and that they are turning to the uh, China is because the West has not acknowledged Russia as a major world power, and. Um, so he's talking about something that happened in the past that we uh, made gestures toward that. But here we have a major problem. But if you turn to, e to China, they want it to be acknowledged to be a major power uh, country. Um, here we've got a country, 1.5 billion people with a thriving economy, and um, it's on the way to becoming number one and compared with Russia, that's on the way down. But if Russia is going to be an equal partner, Russia wants to be that. <laughs> but Mao, he used, uh, he used a map over Moscow, Moscow as his uh, goal. I think Russia is going to be just as disappointed over this lack of people acknowledging them to be a great power as China was in the West. What does that mean for Norway? It means that China, they're going to be just as aggressive as they were in the West because they're not getting this acknowledgement. There's one only response to that, isolation, but deep dissatisfaction to be half isolated. Oh. Hvordan kan vi forholde oss til det? Hvordan skal vi forholde oss til det Russland du beskriver nå de neste 10-20 årene? Der tror jeg at statsminister... I think the prime minister really put his finger on it. Uh, the goal of foreign policy is to make domestic policy policy. We're going to uh, protect our own house, make sure that we don't uh, give up our standard of democracy. We're not going to be eaten up from within. Just like uh, uh, this is a situation that we've been in before. I'm going to take uh, from uh, the Prime Minister's uh, introduction. This is the point with containment. This uh, politic of holding back, keeping um, uh, communism at bay um, so that democracy can function as it is. That is really what we need to do now. I thought this was interesting. Let China be China. You can say China is present and increasingly in Arctic interests. But in spite of everything, there is a big difference. Uh, Russia is the dimensioning power in Russia. There are people in two countries, in the Nordic countries, the polar countries, Norway and Russia, in the Arctic countries. And you go into Tromsø, they are north of the 60th uh, parallel. And that goes through Oslo, Bergen, Helsingfors, Helsinki, and Canada. There, so it's north. Yeah, I didn't catch that. <clears throat> um, yeah, this uh, saying that 10, 15 uh, miles away from uh, NATO is Norway's eyes and ears. 
So we need to be present and be cognizant of this challenge. Two things. In our knowledge environment, there are people here from uh, um, industry and uh, collaboration between you guys and uh, the politicians. What's going on in Russia is in crucial for us. We need to understand what's happening on the inside because that's going to be in change. The uh, Nordic areas, uh, the rights, ocean rights, and we've always been good at that. And for those uh, have, people have been concerned about Supreme Court rulings. One is Fulson matter about windmills, uh, but maybe uh, there was a Supreme Court unanimous uh, ruling about the uh, the Snowkrab affair. We often read uh, our Supreme Court. They uh, are the final say about how our ocean rights this is a key interest for Norway, a core interest for Norway. So we have to make sure that when we orient us and use our force, our power and capacities, what kind of uh, ocean politics are we going to have? It's the Nordic areas are the ones who have the main thing to see. They're the main components. Everything that is in your knowledge and in your head, all that we know and think and talk about, that's important too, of course. Uh, but it says we don't have much time left. But Jonas, your people are calling me and saying uh, that you need to go further. But I have one more question I have to get in before the Prime Minister goes on. But Hannah is burning with a question, so okay. I agree with uh, Stutter. She's saying, is it possible? Are you saying we're closer to 1914 or 1939 with regard to what you were saying? That's a very serious question, really. And I think everybody who's interested in history will think in parallels. I think that with the limitations uh, and that history repeats itself. That book that was written uh, after the First World War called The Sleepwalkers, that dealt with the, we don't, are not asleep at the switch uh, when we're faced with a catastrophe. So we don't want to do that. So the debate about the war in Ukraine, it does remind us uh, about something that I'm unrestful about because it's a week by week escalation of rhetoric. Uh, it just keeps increasing. And if people who are living in Kyiv do this is understandable. I'm not saying but, I'm saying also, how, is, how will Europe look like after this war? What responsibility do we have? Because I think we have a collective responsibility. War is unpredictable. It can, uh, comp you can lose control of it. It can spill over it somehow. How is the uh, Nordic um, uh, security arrangement going to look? So with regard to that, I think 1914 parallel uh, compared to 1939, it's dangerous to be um, captivated by those parallels. And one last thing, what you talked about, Hannah, earlier. When we talked about China and we talked about the United States, if I'm not wrong, it was Tvet that said that we have a tendency to overemphasize uh, China and underemphasize America. So when you think of who's saying that, you need to really see the significance. But I think it's right. Our knowledge about uh, China is right there. We're starstruck by this ma magnificent economy and all the things that they've achieved. But China has enormous vulnerabilities geographically, financially, economically. It's hard for us to see, but they do. And the United States, in spite of some of their political dysfunctionality that has been written about so often, has an enormous and innovative potential. So we have to recalibrate ourselves in the way we uh, approach this. So an optimistic, uh, a little pessimistic, but also mostly optimistic. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.